Good morning. If you have a Bible, turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 6 is where we're going to be this morning, looking at verses 11 through 13. Hope that everyone had a good fourth. We enjoyed it celebrating with our family. A couple of great traditions that we take part in, and I trust that you did the same this weekend. Uh, we're going through the Sermon on the Mount, or the Lord's Prayer, sorry, it's part of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, but we've been walking through the Lord's Prayer over the past several weeks, and we've seen several truths that have come out. I, I've loved this <clears throat> little section. I, I've never preached through it all before, or even, I don't think, taught through it before, so a lot of things have come out to me that I've, I've probably heard but just had forgotten about, and that'll be true also today, but among the truths that we've looked at, We've seen that the Lord's Prayer is, is the skeleton of our prayers. It's the thing that gives shape and structure um, to our prayers, and that without it, our prayers just are a big formless blob. A lot of us feel like our prayers just don't have any shape or structure to it, and they just kind of, words come out unconnected, and it's, it's just a formless kind of a blob. Um, we've seen um, how to get oriented in our prayers so that we don't just bust in the door and start asking for stuff. We have to orient ourselves first um, to our Father in heaven. Uh, we looked last week at the fact that we have to get aligned with God. We're looking for alignment so that we don't pull off in some different direction than the one that God's steering us in, that God is steering us in this direction in his ways according to his plans and that we pull off to, to one side or another so we have to get in alignment with him. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, and today we're moving into the second set of petitions. The first set were the first three requests. A petition is a request. So the first three requests were last week, and they were all centered on God. And this week we're moving uh, into the second set of petitions, a request that Jesus outlines here in this prayer. David Jeremiah said about this prayer, he said, This prayer begins and ends on the peaks of the mountains of God's glorious kingdom. Sounds very high. It starts with our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. And it ends with yours is the kingdom and yours is the power and yours is the glory. Amen. But then he says, but in between, we take a journey into the valley where all of us live. What is the valley where all of us live? We don't always live on the peaks. But he says we live in the, the valley of the lowlands of human need. We all live in the valley of human need. We want to live our lives on the peaks. We want to always be on the mountaintop, but our lives are lived down in the valley. But here's the good thing about that. We normally associate the valleys with bad things, but when you're in the valley, in God's kingdom, what that means is that you can look up anywhere you look and find God. When you're in the valley in God's kingdom and you look up, you'll always see God. Psalm 139 verse 5 in the Holman Christian Standard says, You have encircled me. God is all around me. No matter which direction I turn in, God is always around me. In the New Living Translation, it says this, You go before me and follow me. So he's in front of me and behind me. So everywhere I look, God is there. No matter where I go, he's already beaten me to it. So when I'm aligned with God's name, when I'm aligned with God's agenda, when I am aligned with God's will, that changes, even though I'm in the valley of human need, that changes the way that I view those needs. Viewing my needs, viewing our needs through the lens of alignment with God changes the way that I view my needs. It brings a sharper focus and clarity to the way that I view my needs. So that when I come to this section of the sermon or of the prayer where I'm praying for human needs, my focus doesn't shift one bit. I'm not bringing my eyes downward onto my needs. I keep my eyes focused up and all around me on the peaks of the glory of God and his kingdom. So the key words we've been looking at over the past several weeks, the key words were orient and align, and then this week the key word is rely. Orient, rely, or uh, align, and rely. One of the biggest obstacles to a vibrant prayer life is found right here in what we're looking at today. What's the biggest obstacle to our prayer lives? And, and by the way, I'll say this again. 
Not all of you struggle with this. Many of you probably do have vibrant, thriving prayer lives. If so, that's wonderful. Praise the Lord for that. I'm very happy to hear that. But many of us find ourselves in a struggle in our prayer lives. Many of us find ourselves with a a prayer life that is the opposite of vibrant. It's kind of lethargic and tired. And one of the biggest reasons why our prayer life is not fervent or why our prayer life does not entail the kind of desperation that's called for with our lives is because when you get right down to the bottom of it, this is the reason, we don't pray because we don't think we need him. That's the bottom line. You may say, well, that's not me. Well, why is it that you don't pray if you don't pray? If you don't pray, why don't you pray? The reason, the biggest reason why we don't pray is because we don't really think we need him. Not most of the time, Not in our everyday, day-to-day lives. Now, if something hard happens, that's when we wake up for a moment. That's when we wake up and realize, oh my, I need him. I need God right now. But most days, most ordinary days, we just flat out just don't think we need God. It's not because we're too busy. You can pray even when you're busy. You can pray while you're busy. It's not just because you're lazy. You can pray while you're laying down on the couch. It's not because you don't know how. It's because you don't think you need his help. That's it. That's why I don't do it. That's why you don't do it. We don't really think we need his help. Prayer only makes sense to people who know they need God. It doesn't make sense to people who don't know they need God. If I thought that I would die without God, then I would pray, would you? If I thought I would starve without God, I would pray. If I thought my life would fall apart literally without him, then I would pray. If all of my peace of mind, if all of my well-being, if all of my help, if all of my energy, if all of my joy for living came from his good and loving care, then I would pray. If I thought the purpose of my life, if I thought the direction of my life came from his guiding hand, that I would call out to God and say, God, guide me. God, lead me. If I thought the wisdom that I needed to live in this complex world, in all the situations that I'm going to encounter in a day-to-day life, if I thought that the wisdom to navigate all that came from God, I would pray. If I thought the health of my relationships with other people depended on the health of my relationship with God, then I would pray. If I thought that all of those things that I just said were true, I would pray. And I wouldn't just pray, I'd pray desperately. I'd be on my knees. I'd be on my face. I'd be crying out to God. I would be following the commands of Scripture that tell me to be constant in prayer, to pray without ceasing, to pray at all times in the Spirit, to be vigilant, to watch and pray, to always pray and not lose heart. But those biblical commands will land with a thud in your life if you don't think that you need God in your everyday life. So if your prayer life is non-existent, as many of ours are, if your prayer life is stagnant, if your prayer life is not vibrant, then ask yourself this question this morning, who am I relying on? Who are you relying on? Another way of putting it is, who in whose hands are you entrusting your life? In whose hands are you entrusting your life? Prayer is the way that you say, God, I am putting my life in your hands, not my hands. God, I'm putting my life in your hands. And that's what these three requests say in the passage today. So if you have the text, let's go ahead and look at verse 11, 12, and 13. These are the requests today. Rely, depend, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, There is nothing in the whole realm of Scripture which so plainly shows us our entire dependence upon God as does this prayer and especially these three petitions. They are comprehensive. They cover every part of your life. John Stott said that these petitions cover in principle all our human need. Our material needs, that's our daily bread. Our spiritual needs, the forgiveness of our sins and our debts. Our moral needs, our deliverance from evil. 
What, are, what we are doing whenever we pray this prayer is to express our dependence upon God in every area of our human life. Now, dependence is not an American virtue. Right? We've already talked about dependence is not an American virtue. Independence is an American virtue. We are literally in 4th of July weekend. I did not plan the timing of this out, but we literally just celebrated what we call Independence Day. The day that we declared our independence from Great Britain. And what we were saying, we were making an explicit statement to the crown of England that we are not reliant on any king and that we are perfectly capable of ruling ourselves, of being our own nation without the oversight, without the authority, without the taxes that come with being a part of Great Britain. And I wonder if without meaning to, we're making the same statement to God each day we do not come to him asking him for his help. Are we making that same statement our founders made to Great Britain? Are we declaring our independence from God through our prayerlessness? Because that's what prayerlessness is. Prayerlessness is a declaration of independence to God. And I wonder if this morning if somebody here needs to declare their dependence on God. You don't need a declaration of independence. You need to declare your dependence on God. That is what prayer is. Prayer is a declaration of dependence towards God. And you need to do that. And not just today. This is an everyday declaration. It's one of the things that's so clear in this text. It's perfectly clear in these petitions. We see it in the first petition, and especially our daily reliance on God. C.S. Lewis said, relying on God has to begin all over again, every day, as if nothing had yet been done. Every day. Our reliance on God has to be declared Every day, as if nothing had yet been done. Now, why is that? Is that because God just um, kind of perversely likes to see you beg? Does he just kind of get a a sick, twisted pleasure in seeing you get on your knees and beg? Is that sort of what it is? No, it's, it's not that exactly. It's much, much better than that. I read this quote this week, again, from Martin Lloyd Jones. He said, so many of us tend to think that God is our Father gives us the great gift of grace in one great lump sum. This is like the lottery, right? If you win the lottery, you have two choices. You can either get it all in one big lump sum, or you can ask them to break it up all throughout your life so that you get a monthly payment all throughout the rest of your life. So this is the idea here. Does God give us his grace all in one big lump sum, or does he break it up? Well, Jones goes on. He says uh, that having received it, we just go on living in it. But it is not like that. That would be very dangerous for us. Why would it be dangerous? Because if God just gave us all his glorious gifts of grace in one lump sum, we would be in danger of enjoying the gift and forgetting all about God. For though we cannot understand it, God wants us, and as our Father, he likes us to speak to him. So it's not just that God wants to hear you beg, it's that he wants to spend time with you. He wants me to come to him. He wants you to come to him. He wants you to talk to him. He wants you to ask him for the things that you need. And if he gave it to you all at once, at some point, it may take you a little while, but it would happen. At some point, if he gave it all at one time, you would forget who gave it to you. You would forget about the giver of the gift. And so he set it up in such a way that you can't forget him. I can't forget who the giver of the gift is if I have to go to him every day to ask, right? You're constantly reminded of your need for him. You're constantly reminded of your dependence and reliance on him if you have to come back to him day after day after day. So we show we rely on God by coming to him each and every day and asking him for what we need day by day. So let's let's go ahead and look at the needs. What are the needs that Jesus tells us? This is the valley of human needs. What do we need in the valley of human needs? There are three things. You can look at the verbs, and they come out really clearly. We're asking God to give, forgive, and, and deliver. To give, to forgive, 
and to deliver. So I rely on God in the valley of human needs by asking him to give, to forgive, and to deliver. We're going to look at the first two today. We're going to finish the third one next week, and then we'll finish the prayer up next week as well. So number one, ask him to give. Ask him to give. Look at verse 11. Verse 11 says, give us this day. That is a plea. That is a request. We are asking God here, give us this day our daily bread. I'm just going to point out a couple of things here that we need to be reminded of that come out of this text. Number one, give. God is a giving God. I preached on this last Thanksgiving James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Everything we have that is good comes down from God. God is a giving God. Matthew chapter 7, verse 11, we looked at this about a month ago, says that the Heavenly Father knows how to give good gifts to His children. And then Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, What do you have that you did not receive? What do you have that you did not receive? I know a lot of us like to think that we're the reason for our own success. That we have simply because we were smart. We worked hard. We earned it. We have very much had that kind of culture. And there's nothing wrong with hard work. There's nothing wrong with the sweat of your labor. That's godly. That's biblical. The Bible commands it. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 3.10, For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. So there is no excuse for laziness. So if you have, if you have uh, provided for your family, if you have provided for your future, if you have provided for your needs and your wants through your hard work, then praise the Lord. But that is, understand, that is only one side of it. That's only one part of things. We work, but we work with the strength God supplies. God gave you the strength to be able to work hard. God gave you the brains to know what to do with what you have. God gives you the wisdom to live the life that you're supposed to live. God is the giver of all of those things. And our job is to ask him and then to receive it. So what are we asking for right here? He says, give us this day our daily bread. What is our daily bread? Well, everyone agrees that it's more than just a loaf of bread. That what this means is all the necessities that we need to live each day. All the necessities that you need to live on a day-to-day basis. That includes your food that you're going to eat. That includes the shelter that you lay your head down in at night. That includes the clothes that you put on your body. Now, what every Jew who heard this would have probably thought of immediately when Jesus talks about a daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. They would have thought of manna. You'll remember the story. All of you probably know it. Manna was was the miracle bread that God provided the Israelites when they were wandering around in the wilderness after they left Egypt. And if you know the story, they would go to sleep with no food to eat, but they would wake up the next morning and uh, God would have miraculously rained down this bread, this strange bread, wafers of bread all over the ground. They would cover the ground. But God gave Israel, this is very important, a very important command about this manna. Even though it filled in abundance the ground, God told them they could only gather as much as they could eat for one day. That's it. Just a day. You can only get enough for today. If you try to gather more than today, he's like, we're going to get a couple of extra days worth just in case. You know, let's grab some. Get all you can get. Put it in your pocket. Put it in the fridge. Put it in the freezer. What would happen to it? It would spoil. You only got enough for this day. Only enough for one day. And what God was showing them was that he was going to be their daily provider. He was showing them that they needed to be dependent on him day by day. You know that God does not promise. He doesn't. God does not promise you provision for next week today. You realize that? God doesn't promise you next Tuesday's food today. He promises you today's provision today. And that's it. That's all he promises. Some of us need to remember that. That's all Jesus has promised right here. 
That's all that we're to ask for right here. We're not saying, God make me wealthy. God make me rich. Is there anything wrong with being rich? Is it a sin to be rich? No. That's just not what we're to ask for. We're not to ask for wealth and riches. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 8 says, Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only, and that's a different translation, but give me only my daily bread. Why? Why? Verse 9. Lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Hear that question. If I have too much to eat and I'm full, I say, who's God? What do we say the danger was? We would forget God. Who's God? Who's the Lord? Lest I be full. Or, lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. So I don't want to forget the Lord. So I ask him each day for my daily bread. Now let's stop on this for just a second because let's, let's be honest. Let's be honest. I'm looking around. Nobody's starving in here. I ain't trying to make a statement about anybody. Just saying there's nobody lacking daily bread. I'm not lacking my daily bread. There's nobody in here unclothed. There's nobody in here this morning doesn't have somewhere to go when they leave here to lay their head down. You got somewhere you can go, lay down and take a nap. You got somewhere you can go and lay down tonight and go to sleep. Now, we may not have everything we want, right? How many times have you complained, gosh, I only have 10 pairs of shoes. I don't have enough for, for every day of the month. I don't have... A fridge full of ribeye steak. I love ribeye steak. All I got is this loaf of bread and some peanut butter. But I got my bread. I may not have the house I always imagined, but I have a house, right? All of us have our daily bread. We all have it. So it's like, do I leave this off? Give us this day our daily bread. Am I supposed to ask for my daily bread when I've already got my daily bread? I guess that's the question I'm asking. What do you think? Yes or no? Yes. That's not a trick question. Yes. In fact, it's probably more important for you to ask for your daily bread as someone who already has it than it is for someone that doesn't have it. I read this this week. It said material affluence is no respect, in no respect lessens my need to rely on God. Actually, it increases it. I'm in greater spiritual danger when I have plenty than when I have nothing. Hence the almost greater need of the wealthy to cry to God for mercy that they may not fail to trust him. I want to confess something to you this morning. I am preaching this not only to you, but I'm preaching this to myself. I don't know how you pray. I don't know if you ask for your daily bread, but I want to tell you I've not been praying that prayer. Why not? Because I've already got it. I've already got a pantry full of food. I've got plenty of clothes to put on, even though I almost always wear the same thing. I've got a place to lay my head down at night. I've got all those things. I've not been praying for that because I already have it. But what Jesus said here is, no, that is the very reason why you need to be praying for it. Don't ever forget where what you have comes from. So sure, I'll thank God for what I have, but I don't ever think to ask him because I just take it for granted that I'm going to have it. Why? I don't think I need him for it. I don't think I need him for those things. Do you? Do you ask God? I'm not saying do you thank him at the blessing. I'm saying do you ask him when you get up in the morning? God, give me the things I need today. Because that is an acknowledgement of your dependence on Him. It is an acknowledgement of your reliance and need on Him. It's an acknowledgement to say, God, I could not exist without you. Give me the day's necessities. Lord, please give it to me. So that's my confession to you. And I'm committing myself to pray to God. I'm committing myself to remind myself each morning when I get up and each evening when I go to bed, God, would you give me what I need today. And then guess what? I'll thank him for it when he gives it to me. That's the cool thing about it. 
He gives you the things you need when you ask him. And then you can thank him. And then when I go to bed at night, I'll say, God, give me what I need tomorrow. Would you give me what I need tomorrow to live? Ask him to give. Then number two, and this is the last one we'll look at today. Ask him to forgive. Ask him to give. Ask him to forgive. Verse 12. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now, I want us to get this right. We need to know what we're asking for here. We need to know what we're talking about right here because this is a very important clause in this prayer. How do I know it's important? Because this is the only one Jesus went on and added some additional commentary to at the end of the prayer. After the prayer is over, Jesus comes back, and in verse 14 he says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So it's the only statement he comes back to at the end of the prayer. It's a very, very important statement. But I want you to understand, this is not about the forgiveness of salvation. This is not about the forgiveness that comes when you get saved. This is not like salvation versus damnation here, right? This is not he won't forgive you and let you go to heaven. That's not what this is about. Now, when I come to faith in Christ, when I put my trust in Jesus and Jesus alone, when he saves me, he does forgive me of my sins. That is a part of it. He washes me clean. He washes me white as snow. He forgives me of all of my sin debt, and my debt does incur a penalty. It does incur, uh, uh, or my sin does incur a debt against God, but God forgives me of that sin debt. He frees me from it. I don't owe it anymore. Jesus paid it all for me. He canceled the debt of my sin. That is the gospel, and that is a wonderful and beautiful thing, but this is not about that. This is not that prayer. This is a prayer for people who have already entered into the family of God. When he teaches us to pray, our Father in heaven, it's only God's children who pray, our Father in heaven. So this is a prayer of already forgiven people. So what's the point of this prayer? The point of this prayer is, this is about restoration of our fellowship with the Father when we still sin. Because even though you got saved and God forgave you of the judicial penalty of your sin, you are still going to wake up and sin. Some of you started the day out with a sin probably. Like you sinned before you got out of bed. You sinned right when you got out of bed. You sinned in the shower this morning. You sinned at breakfast this morning. You sinned on the way to church this morning. I don't know what your sin was, but all of us have probably already committed some sin because we still sin against God even though we're saved. So the thing is, when I do sin, what happens? When I, as a follower of Jesus Christ, when you sin each day, what happens? Does God disown you? No. Does God kick you out of the family? No. No, he doesn't kick you out. Do I lose my salvation? No. So it's not that I lose the salvation. It's not that Jesus recondemns me to hell when I sin each day. No, but what happens is I go out of fellowship with God. How many of you have ever gotten out of fellowship with a friend or someone in your family? Something happened. Someone sinned against you. You sinned against someone else. And that fellowship in those moments are broken and things get a little bit awkward between you. I was thinking about this because I still have kids, but I remember when I was a kid and I would do something stupid. I would sin against my parents. I'd disobey my parents or whatever, and I'd be in trouble. And then somehow I'd get stuck riding in the car with them. And I'd be riding up in the front seat with my dad and neither of us would be talking. We'd just be sitting there awkward, right? You're just sitting there and nobody's saying anything. Nobody laughs at any jokes. There's just this weird tension that takes place when your fellowship is broken, right? Right? And that's similar to what's being talked about right here. When we sin against God, we get in that awkward moment. The tension is there. We don't have that fellowship. And what do we want? When I'm the kid riding in the front seat, I want my dad just to laugh. I want him to talk to me normal again. I don't want to just sit there in silence. I want my fellowship to be put back together again. 
That is what we're crying out for right here. That's what we're asking for. And the reason this is daily is because we sin every day. Every day we break our fellowship with God. Some of you have been out of fellowship with God for a very long time. Why? Because you haven't come to him and said, God, would you forgive me of my debt? What does he say to do here? When my fellowship is broken, he said, put down your pride and forgive us our debts. This is confession. This is repentance. This is God. I messed up. I sinned against you. I'm out of fellowship with you right now. And I know I'm your child, but I can feel the tension. I'm sorry. Would you forgive me? I turn back to you right now. And when you do that, guess what? God is right there, willing and ready to extend that forgiveness to you and to restore your fellowship. He's not the kind of God that's like, God, I turn from my sin. Would, would, would you please forgive me? He's not the God that goes, technically, yes, but I'm going to make you pay. It's going to be awkward for a while. God doesn't do like we do. That's what we do. I'm sorry for what I did to you. Okay, okay I forgive you, but you're going to pay. You're going to pay. No, God stands ready. As many times as we come to him. It's what Jesus said. Well, what if I did it yesterday and now i got to do it again today? Yes. What if I did it two days ago and also did it yesterday and then i got to do it again today? Yes. Why? Because he said, as many times. How, how many times should we forgive the one that comes in repentance and confession? Jesus said in Matthew 18, verse 22, that we do it 70 times 7. Does that mean we got 490 times? Taked it off. We're at 395. I got five more. I'm bad at math. 105 more, whatever it is. No. The point is as many times as it takes. Every day if you have to. Every day if you have to. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When is the last time you confessed your sins and asked God to forgive your debt and restore your fellowship? When's the last time you've confessed? I'm not talking about Catholic. I'm not talking about come to me to confess your sins to God. You don't have to go to the priest. Jesus is the priest. When's the last time you confessed? Some of you already said you've been out of fellowship with God for I don't know how long. You're his child, but you're out of fellowship, and you're riding around in the car with him, and it's awkward. It's awkward. You feel the tension. It's a little weird in the room with God right now because you're out of fellowship with him. I wish someone would take a minute today. I don't know who it is would take just a minute today and go to God and say, God, I confess my sin to you. Would you forgive me? And would you restore the fellowship? And then watch as that tension dissipates between you and God. But now I want you to hear what he says next. I said this last week, this prayer is not easy. It's not an easy prayer. Because what he actually says, it's not Forgive us our debts full stop, and he cuts it off right there. No, he goes on, doesn't he? He says, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Forgive us in the same way we've forgiven others. Do you know what he's saying here? <clears throat> what he's saying right here is that if you are harboring unforgiveness in your heart against someone, then you need to know that is, that is going to wreck your fellowship with God. If you harbor unforgiveness in your heart towards someone, that is wrecking your fellowship with God. Because you cannot be in right fellowship with God while at the same time you refuse to forgive a brother or a sister in Christ. 
Do you realize that? That's what I take from what he said. I can't be in right fellowship with God if I refuse to forgive my brother or sister. I can't. Some would take it a step further than that. David Jeremiah said, if unforgiveness fills our heart, it seems clear the Holy Spirit does not. Some of you this morning, I don't know who, but some of you this morning are out of fellowship with God because you're out of fellowship with a brother or sister in Christ. And until you're ready to deal with that, you're not ready to be restored to God, to fellowship with God. It's breaking your fellowship. Tim Keller said, unresolved bitterness is a sign that we are not right with God. It also means that if we are holding a grudge, we should see the hypocrisy of seeking forgiveness from God for our sins. That's what Jesus is saying right here. Remember, he's just finished talking about, if you go back, he's just finished talking about hypocrisy, religious hypocrisy. So what it seems he's saying here is this is the ultimate in hypocrisy. And I would agree with that. The ultimate hypocrisy is that you and I, listen to this, the ultimate hypocrisy is that you and I would rejoice in the forgiveness of God while we refuse to extend it to somebody else. Is there a higher hypocrisy than that? Oh God, I thank you for your forgiveness Thank you for your fellowship. Thank you for restoring me back to full fellowship with you. And yet you refuse to do that with a brother or sister in Christ. You're rejoicing in God's forgiveness while you're holding it over someone else's head. Jesus said God will will forgive you and restore your fellowship to the degree that you're willing to do that for other people. Forgive us as we have forgiven. I told you it's hard. Requires great humility to be able to do that. Martin Luther said, In the presence of God, everyone must duck his head and come into the joy of forgiveness only through the low door of humility you need help to put this into practice and that's what this prayer is understand this prayer this prayer is not you just asking God to forgive you of your sins and to restore your fellowship with God it's asking God to forgive you of your sins and for the strength and humility that you need to be able to forgive others so when you pray, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven those that have uh, forgiven our debtors, you're saying, God, would you give me humility? Would you give me the strength to better give other people the same thing that you gave me? Who do you need to forgive today? <clears throat> We're going to cut this off today, right here. Come back next week. We're going to look at lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We're going to look at deliverance next week, and we're going to close with this great blessing that his is the kingdom. But for today, I want to close with this question. Question I started off with. Who do you rely on? Who do you rely on for your day-to-day life? for your physical needs, for your spiritual needs, for your moral needs. Jesus is saying, if you rely on anyone else but our Father in heaven, then you are heading for a breakdown. And I can assure you that you are. Jesus said, pray like this. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Would you pray with me?